Thank you. I'm just going to try to talk real loud. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me, everybody. Excited to talk to you guys about workforce. This is something I'm very passionate about. Hopefully, you pick up on that with my presentation. This is a photo of me and my, my skid steer that I dressed up as a cow because I think it's funny. And uh, so I, I have my patch, my skid steer patch on today. So we're going to talk about workforce because that's the big, big money topic right now in the industry. Um, I'm going to start with a story about Turner Mining Group. You guys probably know of them. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about me, but we're going to get into a, a somewhat of a case study that I've created out of these guys in their first year of business. Um, this, the, the story about how I got started with them was I, would, uh, I was in college, still at Arizona State University, and I remember sitting at the gym. It was one of those days where you're working out, but you're not working out all that hard. So you're kind of sitting on your phone a little bit and scrolling through Instagram or looking at pictures on the internet. And I, I would see these pictures from this guy, Keaton Turner. And, and they, were, they were spectacular photos of mining operations. And not only were they spectacular photos, but he was going in depth on how they estimated their projects and why they chose this truck over that truck and why this excavator is paired with that truck. And, it was information that I'd never seen before in mining. I was so drawn in because it was somebody on the inside telling me about how mining actually works. And so fast forward a little bit, I start this thing, build wit, start a social media page, it starts to grow. Uh, I'm working for a software company in Texas at the time. <clears throat> I message Keaton, I say, hey, you haven't posted on, on the internet for a while, what the heck's going on? He said, well, I started a, uh, started a mining company. Cool. And he said, well, we have a project in Texas. I know you're living in Texas. Let me know when we're, when we're there, or uh, I'll let you know when I'm there and we can get dinner. So <clears throat> I drive a few hours after work to go meet this guy for dinner. Never met him before. Uh, just seen his stuff on the internet. And we talk about the future of mining and, and we're these two young bucks at this steakhouse in New Braunfels, Texas, talking about storytelling and where the future of, of mining is gonna go. And we just had a fantastic time. So. That's the first time I meet this guy. And then a few months later, maybe just a few weeks later, I, I quit my job abruptly, which I'll talk about in a moment. And I needed to make money somehow. Uh, I had no business plan or anything. I just quit my job because I was tired of it. And then, oh shoot, I need to actually do something to support myself. So I called Keaton, I said, hey, let me come and take pictures of you guys. Let me start sharing about your company on the internet. You guys are new, I'm new, let's go do this together. Uh, so we worked with each other for about a year, their first year in business, maybe 16 months. So I haven't worked with them in a while. I don't keep up with them all that much today. But it was a really fascinating, fascinating year. And I'm going to get into that. I think it's arguably one of the most fascinating case studies on workforce development and mining in the past few years. And, and I was there. I got to see it up close and personal. And now there's plenty of opinions out there about this company, where they're at today, where they've gone, what they've done right, what they've done wrong. I'm gonna focus today on, hey, they had a few things figured out in those early days that completely bucked the trend. They didn't have a workforce problem. They had thousands of people applying to work for them. They had kids flying all over the country to go hop in equipment. And they, were, they, were, they didn't have this problem that everybody else is having. Why is that? What are those themes there that we can take and implement within our businesses today to start getting to be in a better position than we are right now with workforce. Um, so where we're going, how the heck did they get thousands of applicants in just a seemingly overnight period of time? How the heck did they do that? And I sat down maybe a few months ago, six months ago, and I just started thinking about it, like how the heck did they do that? And I boiled it down to a few different principles that I think would apply and work for any mining company right now. And what steps out of that can we start putting into practice? What can, we, what can we do today? And this doesn't cost a whole lot of money. This isn't crazy. But what can we start doing today to actually start chipping away at this problem? Because I don't know about you guys, but it's been the same conversation for a while now, and there hasn't been any significant change. We got to do something about this. So the people problem, let's talk a little bit about that. Let's define the problem. Um, it's, it's troubling, and I traveled the entire United States. I went to 40 states last year. It's, it's across the whole country, so it's not just your region, it's not just Georgia, it's not just your company, it's, it's everywhere. The whole industry is facing this. This is the biggest issue in the industry right now, and it's, it's, people are starting to sweat a little bit. DOTs aren't letting big projects because they don't know if the job's gonna get done. Uh, deadlines are starting to get pushed. 
you, maybe you can't bid on work if you're a contractor because you don't have the workforce for it. It's starting to affect the businesses that are in this industry that were not affected previously. Um, everything starts with people. So I'm a big Abraham Maslow human psychology fan and there's this hierarchy of needs in human psychology. So it's something like food, water, shelter. If that's not provided for you, then nothing else really matters. Well, in, in business, in mining, in, in at least my business, and probably your businesses too, it all starts with people. So if you don't figure out the whole people thing, it doesn't matter what your balance sheet looks like, what your fleet looks like, what your reserves look like. If you don't have people, then all of that is not worth anything anymore. So we need to figure out this problem before we can go on to do other stuff. And there's a lot of other problems we can focus on. We can be more sustainable, we can be more productive, we can, we can be better members of our, our communities. But if we don't figure out the people problem, then we can't do any of that. Um, this, is, this is huge. This is a very competitive, competitive industry. And everybody thinks we're competing against each other, but we're not, we're not. We're all on the same team here. We're all on the same team. And this is especially prevalent with contractors because the contractors are always bidding against each other. So the other guys are the enemy and they've probably swapped people back and forth. You know, they've hired your people. You've probably hired their people. But let me tell you, in the dirt world, as we call it, we're all on the same team. We're competing with every other industry in the United States. We're not competing with ourselves. And until we get on the same team and say, hey, we're all on the same team here. Let's figure this out together. We're not gonna be able to make significant, a significant impact here. Um, we've tried to do certain things. I've seen companies, especially lately, say, hey, well, we raised wages, so problem solved. I guarantee you, maybe, maybe it has solved your problem today. It's a, it's a Band-Aid. It's not going to make any noticeable difference long term. I promise. I promise. There's a lot of other studies and a lot of other industries that prove this. My generation, maybe it worked for past generations, but this future generation, this isn't, it's not a financial equation at the end of the day. Sure, money is a part of it. Sure, raising wages is beneficial. I, I'm not gonna be upset about a, a, a gain in my wage. Uh, with inflation especially, we need to ra raise wages, but this is a just temporary solution. This is not fixing anything. This is just trying to kick the can down the road a little bit more. Um, okay, we can't fail, we can't fail. So big, big troubling problem. We are serving a big industry, but this is bigger than us. This is bigger than our businesses. This is an essential industry. We are the foundation of society. So this is a pressing problem, yes, for our businesses, yes, for our people, existing people now and, and, and our vendors, but this is, a, this is a bigger problem because society is depending on us. So we need to figure this out. I can't tell society like, hey, sorry, we, we couldn't figure out our people thing, so we just can't, I don't know, provide aggregate for you. So the, whole, the roads you drive on, you can't do that anymore. Or, you know, water, power, a lot of the other industries we cover. We need to figure that out. Everybody's depending on us to figure this out. It's a lot bigger than just our businesses. So this is where it boils down to this people problem. Is, is our success is our responsibility, extreme ownership. I don't know, I don't know if you guys know Jocko. Jocko Willink, Extreme Ownership, life-changing book if you haven't read it. And it's all about how every problem is your responsibility. So there's been a lot of, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, millennials don't want to work or colleges or whatever the, the, the causes that we believe is, is creating this problem, whatever those causes are, it still doesn't matter. It's still our problem to solve. We still need to do something about it. No one's coming to save the day. This is our problem. We need to change what we're doing if we're gonna see anything meaningful um, as far as, as making this problem a little bit better. So my story, to give you guys a little bit of uh, background on who the heck I am, I, I did not grow up in a blue collar household whatsoever. My dad's a tax lawyer, so it's just polar opposite of blue collar. Um, I grew up in Scottsdale, Arizona, a beautiful place. That's Camelback Mountain. I grew up just on the other side of it. And uh, so I, 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 I had no blue collar experience. I didn't have an uncle in construction or aggregate or nothing. But what I did have was this, this weird love and attraction to bulldozers and things that push dirt around. I always loved the dirt world. And to prove it, I have photographs. This is my sixth birthday party. I am, this is me right here. This is my brother. Those are my friends. I was the coolest kid in my class, kindergarten class. 
at the Caterpillar dealership. My dad was doing tax work for the Caterpillar dealership. So he talked to the CFO or whoever it was and arranged the birthday party to be at the cat dealership. And from that point on, um, I was just glued to this industry, but from afar, from you know, driving around town and looking out the window at the trucks and tractors, but I didn't have any real exposure to it. Up until, uh, this is at, in high school is when things started to change for me. I was talking to my friend's dad about, uh, I was buying an aquarium at the time. That's a whole other presentation and weird uh, love of mine. Um, so buying an aquarium, when I was 14, I didn't have very much money to buy an aquarium, and I was telling him, yeah, it's really expensive. And he calls me up later that day, he's like, uh, well, how much money do you need? I'm like, I need $200. And he said, I'll give you the $200 right now, uh, but you owe me $30 interest. You know, it was ridiculous amount of interest, 15%. And uh, you have to come to work for me in Montana to pay it off this summer. And I'd been to Montana, I'd been here a bunch of times over since I was six years old. I'd known him for a very long time, but I never worked. And so I went up there in Montana, I got into debt when I was 14, it was the coolest thing in the world. He gave me money, and then I worked it off later. It was awesome. Um, and I went up to Montana, and uh, at 14 I just got my ass kicked for the first time in my life. And it sobered me up really, really quick. And showed me that, whoa, hey, you have the opportunity to go do anything. You, I didn't have parents telling me I needed to be a doctor. I didn't have these financial burdens. I, I didn't grow up in this, this rough neighborhood that constrained me to certain paths in life. I really could go do anything. So this is when I started to think about, hey, what do I really love? What am I drawn to? And let's go start there and see where life goes, goes from there. So I call the guy on the left, Rich Pearson, my senior year of high school because his company was working in my neighborhood and I would see the trucks drive through the neighborhood every day and everybody was so pissed off about these trucks because it was a bunch of rich people and God forbid someone comes in and tries to prevent their house from flooding, you know, and putting in concrete pipe. But I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. It was the 385 excavator on this narrow little city street, 108 inch concrete pipe. So these trucks said Pearson Construction Corporation on them. And I, I figured, well, let me just Google Pearson Construction Corporation. Let me find their phone number. Let me call him up and ask for Mr. Pearson and talk to this guy. So for whatever reason, he says, sure, kid, I'll talk to you. So I meet this guy at his office. And uh, I, I talk to him about construction. This was the first construction guy I'd ever met. And I was fascinated. I was so enamored by this whole world of, of building things and creating things. And uh, I asked him for a job, and so he uh, said, call me when you're 18. I called him again when I was 18, legally could go to work in construction. And then I got a job as a laborer for Pearson Construction Corporation. I had nothing to offer. I was just this kid, um, no real work experience, knew absolutely nothing about the industry. But I just put my head down and did whatever the hell I was told. So that's what kicked off my, my blue collar career. Um, so it's, it's I'm, I, I, I tell this story too to a lot of people because I'm a good example of someone who has no business being in the blue collar world, yet I'm here anyway because it's a great place to be. And that's an example of what we need to do to develop this workforce. We need to go beyond people whose dads and grandpas and great grandpas have done this because that's a dwindling pool. We need to go outside of that. We need to find the people who shouldn't be here and draw them in because it's a really cool place to be for the right kind of person. Um, I wanted to start a construction company, so I worked through school. Every year I went to a different company. So I did two years as a laborer. I worked on the, the railroad for a summer, which was just unbelievably miserable. Um, the, on, on the right was with Kiwit. I was doing drilling and blasting, so I was loading shots every single day, doing all the blast plans. It was a ton of fun, throwing around bags of explosives every day as a 21-year-old kid. Uh, went to work in road construction. And uh, by the time I'd graduated high school, I had a lot of experience in the construction industry, had all these stories to tell. So this is when I started sharing stories on the internet, which is what brought me to what I'm doing today, BuildWit. Um, I had all these stories about the construction industry, about uh, I was producing jetty stones, so I'd gotten into the aggregate world, mining a little bit. And um, I noticed that no one was telling all that compelling of a story on the internet about the industry. Or if they were, it was, it was in short supply. And I thought, hey, I could start telling stories in a, in a much greater greater manner. So started sharing stories on the internet. It takes off. I quit my job and start doing the storytelling thing full time. Um, so that was four years ago yesterday. So we're four years old now. 
And uh, there was no business plan or anything like that. It was just, hey, I'm going to run around the country with a camera. I'm going to buy a camera. I smashed the thing two weeks later. It was heartbreaking. And I'm going to try to make a business out of this. Um, to give you guys a little bit of background on BuildWit, what the heck we do. Um, this is our team. This was about, we have a little over 30 people here. Uh, this was this summer. We're at about 70 now. So full time, we have, it's, it's grown significantly. It's making my head spin right now. Um, some of these people do have blue collar backgrounds. So we have hired people out of the industry, which is really cool. A lot of them don't, which is again, we're, we're taking people from outside the industry, introducing them to the industry. And it's been fun watching people that have never been around the dirt world fall in love with it like, like I'm in love with it. Um, here's our office in, in Nashville, Tennessee. On the right, it's a little hard to see in this, in this photo, but making the dirt world a better place, that's our higher purpose, that's our mission. That's where the business begins, is hey, we are going to create a business that does whatever we need to do to make the dirt world a better place. And workforce is a big part of making the dirt world a better place. How do we help make this workforce problem go away? Because we can do a lot of cool stuff if we can make this thing go away, and I think we can make it go away. Um, Training, so we, we started out as a marketing business doing storytelling, like I said. We still do that for companies uh, across the United States, but we're also developing software. We're developing a whole training platform, custom built for the dirt world right now. Um, so there's a lot of cool stuff. We're, we just took on a, a first round of investment end of last year. We're going into a Series A round uh, in the next few months. So we're about to, we're pouring gasoline on the fire right now and we're about to pour even more on it, which is pretty exciting stuff. Um, I travel the world, which is why I have the opinions that I do, whether sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. If you listen to the podcast, you've probably heard both of those. Um, but I have a really unique perspective because I get to see so much of the industry from such a, um, a neutral point of view. I'm not a vendor. I'm not selling things. I'm not a contractor. I don't bid against anybody. I can just somewhat walk into a lot of these places and ask any question I want to ask, and they just give me answers. And after doing that for four years, being on planes every single week, I've been on, I think, 25 flights this year already, uh, you get to see a lot of cool stuff and learn a lot of cool things from, from cool people. Um, on the left is uh, the biggest drag line in the United States. That's the number nine drag line in uh, Wyoming. In the middle there is North Dakota. That's a Crest coal hauler, the, one of the wackiest machines you'll see. It looks like it's straight out of Star Wars. And then on the right, uh, a picture. I went to the Middle East uh, for the second time last month. So I got to work with the Saudi Arabian cat dealer to go see some of the uh, massive development projects out there. Um, just to prove that, and what I'm going to talk about, again, I'm going to get to the workforce development part of the presentation, I promise. I, uh, I'm going to talk about workforce development. I'm not a contractor. I don't hire blue collar folks. But we've implemented everything I'm about to say. We've implemented at our business too. It works at any business. And to prove it, hiring right now is not a huge struggle for us. We, we just hired 35 people since January 1, so we doubled the size of our company, and we had 114 applicants per every one position. So that wasn't 114 total, that was 114 per every single position we advertised for, 35 positions. We've lost four people since August 1, both voluntary and in involuntary, so our turnover is, is negligible, and then average age is 33. So again, I'm not, I, these aren't blue collar people. I'm not, I'm not a, a, a rock you know, aggregate producer, but it's the same principles and it's working quite well for us. And I, I know for a fact it'll work well for you guys too. So let's get into the case study. And again, these are just a few principles that based on my observations from an inside perspective and then later from an outside perspective, I have, I have been able to make and pull out and say, hey, this can work for any company. These, this, this little formula, there's something here that, that can make it work and you can implement any one of these. And I think each one of these will start chipping away at the problem. Now, am I presenting some magic potion? No, absolutely not. You have to do all this and it's gonna require people to be uncomfortable and think differently and it's maybe gonna require capital and effort and that's, but it's a big problem and it's a problem that we need to solve. So. Um, this is my basically kind of my best guess at what we could do today to help start alleviating this thing. Um, first, clearly define higher purpose. Everybody that went to work there knew why they were going to work there beyond money. 
why should I come to work for you? And it sounds entitled, but that's where the workforce is at right now. I need a reason why I should come to work for you. And a paycheck is not a compelling reason. Benefits is not compelling. That's everybody has that. Everybody has it great. It's a paycheck. Cool. That's, that's fantastic. But what's that higher purpose? What's the why behind coming to work for you? And the coolest thing, this isn't that hard for this industry to define. Like I said, all of society depends on us. We're the foundation for everything going on around us, every other industry. That's a big why. But we need to define that and we need to articulate that because a lot of people in the industry, they just show up for a job. They don't understand why am I producing this rock? Why do I work for this company? Even though it has big impact, we haven't been able to articulate that. Um, they leverage social media to reach a national audience. This is huge. So mining historically has just been off in the shadows. Hey, we're, we're, we're good. We don't need to talk about what we do. Uh, but the problem is with that, with not just aggregate, just mining in general, is that then other people control the narrative because we haven't controlled it. The story is being told whether we tell it or not. And so if you don't tell your story, and not that social media is the only way to tell your story, but let me tell you, it's a very effective way to do it, and it's completely free, by the way. If you don't do that, there's other people on social media telling your story. So if some guy gets fired, he's pissed off, he says, this company sucks, Brent sucks. But Brent's not there to say, well, no, I don't suck. Here's why I don't suck. Then I just see Brent sucks. I'm like, yeah, Brent does suck. <laughs> they all know that. <laughs> And maybe that wasn't the best example. But, but that's where you have to control, control the narrative. And using something like a social media is, is fantastic. And it's, it's 2022. Social media is here to stay. It is here, man. Let me tell you. And maybe you guys don't use it, or I don't know if you think it's all that valuable. But this next generation, that's where they are. That's where they are. And this whole thing is how do we track the next generation? OK, cool. We need to go where they are. Where are they? They're on their phones. Let's go to their phones. Let's tell that story. Um, and then Keaton Turner, the highest level is bought in. And this is key as well. If we're going to solve this problem, it needs to start from the top. The highest level has to be bought in. And that's why this works so well. Um, uh, <clears throat> this is big. And I know this is scary for a lot of folks, especially in mining. This is still a new concept. But they empowered and trusted their people to share their experiences. I, your, your people are, are hands down your best spokespeople, your best spokespeople, without question. Sure, it's important for the company to get its narrative out there, absolutely, but what your loader operator says about your quarry is gonna mean so much more than what the company says about it in a lot of different ways, especially from a recruiting standpoint. So they empowered their people and they trusted their people. They trusted them, and this is big. This is huge. I've learned about this in my business. We tell people day one, hey, I trust you. I trust you to do the right thing. And when someone looks at you in the eyes and says they trust you and they mean it, I, I'm not going to screw that up. We don't get screwed because we trust people. If you think people suck, it's going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think you're going to get screwed, if you think they're untrustworthy, they're going to be untrustworthy. But if you say, hey, we trust you to do the right thing, we trust you to tell the story how it should be told, that you think that makes, makes, makes us look good, makes this whole thing go around, it's actually going to start to become, a, again, this self-fulfilling prophecy. It's going to start to come together. So your, best, your, your people are your best spokespeople. They, they empowered and trusted their people to tell the story as well. They created an entry point with no prior experience. Rock truck driver. Experienced people already have jobs. They're already working. And if there's an experienced person looking for work right now, that's probably not the best sign. We all know that. Why are we still trying to hire all these experienced people? And I know experienced people, there's so much value in experience. But we also need to create a new workforce. To create a new workforce, we have to create an entry point. And maybe you guys say, well, yeah, we already have that. We already hire rock truck drivers with no experience. And yeah, we'll train them up. Are you telling people about that? Can I go to your website and see that, hey, I'm a young kid, I want to get in the mining industry, I can go work for this company and they're going to train me up? If you don't tell that story, if you don't articulate that, then it's still not worth a whole lot. So they created this entry point and then they got the word out about, hey, if you're a good person, if you're ready to work, we'll put you in a rock truck, we'll train you up, let's go do it. 
That's the only way we go solve this problem. We have to get new people into the industry. That's gonna require us to train. That's gonna require us to bring people in without experience, which is potentially scary, which is potentially fraught with liability, but we all know we can do it in a safe and effective manner. They heavily invest in recruitment. So people is the biggest problem in the industry right now, and yet it's not treated strategically. You have all these managers and all these executives, and yet HR is still this, it's like over here, this still this little compliance function of all of these businesses. We need to treat it bigger than that. We have, we have Nikki, who, who is the strategic side of the people in our business. Every executive meeting we have, Nikki's there. Because without people, hey, we're nothing. We need, we need a representative of our people involved in every step of the way of building this company. So they, Turner Mining Group, they had a full-time recruiter almost since day one, focused on craft, which doesn't make sense for a company that size, but then it makes perfect sense, because it's like, well, if they need people, and so they should probably have someone dedicated to finding people full-time. We just went from 35 to 70, not by accident, but because we have four people full-time, two recruiters, dedicated to finding and retaining the best people we can get for our business. It's strategic. It's strategic. It's not this afterthought. It's not this compliance function. It's strategic. <clears throat> and then they heavily invested in marketing and storytelling. You have to reframe marketing. I, I get it. Everybody's selling a lot of rock. Everybody's building a lot of stuff. You have to reframe it from it's just a business development function to, hey, this is a tool we can use to build our internal culture, to build pride in what we do here, to go recruit that next generation, to get the word out. So you have to reframe it and think about marketing and storytelling. It's not increasing sales. And then if you go get more people, you solve your workforce problem, then you can increase more sales. Then everybody wins. But it's, I would approach it, and we approach it from, this is a, a critical function of our business, but because of, of people building culture, and if we build our people, build our culture, our business will get built after that. So to summarize here, what can you do? Define your unique higher purpose. I'm telling you if you, go to out to your, if you go out to any of your people and you ask them, why the hell are you here? What's our higher purpose? And they can't tell you, that's a problem. You can go into my office right now, ask anybody in there, why are you here? They will say, we're here to make the dirt world a better place. We start, we train on that day one. Day one, onboarding, we talk about mission. And I teach the class, because it's that important. And I know, I just have 70 people. You know, who knows if it's scalable or not. But it's really important. Day one, we're saying, hey, this is why we're here. This is why, this is why you're here. And I know money's important, sure, and benefits and all that, and we're gonna make sure you're taken care of so you can support your family, pay your mortgage, whatever that is. But this is why you're doing what you're doing day to day beyond all of that. And it means a whole lot. So if you don't have your higher purpose defined, sit down, talk about it, define it. It should be easy in this industry because we have such a profound higher purpose. We are the foundation of society, that's really cool. But how is, that, how is it unique to your business? Invest in people recruiting storytelling like you do production equipment. I see the checks you guys write. I see them. I know how much you guys spend on this equipment. I know how much you guys spend on, on all, sorts of, all sorts of fun stuff that drive your businesses. Your people drive your businesses too. I don't see the same investment in recruiting. I don't see the same investment in storytelling, in people. Where can you invest more in these, in these, in these problems? I see, I see the bank accounts right now, the amount of cash sitting out there. I see the amount of money everybody's making. We need to take some of that and invest in this problem. Invest in telling our story. Invest in finding the best people. Invest in our people currently. How can we do even more for them? All of that's gonna mean a lot. And maybe that's not money. Maybe that's just time and energy. But we have to invest heavier in this problem or else it's not gonna get any better. And it's not getting any better right now. Tell your story consistently. So maybe it's social media, and I'm telling you, social media is such a wonderful tool. I employ over 70 people, I'm 27 years old, because of social media. I would not have anything I have right now without social media. It's an amazing tool. It's amazing. But maybe social media is not it. Just tell your story consistently. And sharing one thing about your company once a month is not enough. Like if, you're, if you have you know, multiple operations, 
There's so many fantastic things going on in your operations day to day that you could be talking about. You could be highlighting different projects. You could be highlighting customers, vendors, individuals. There's so many different stories to tell. We have to do it consistently. And it has to be a group effort. We want high school kids, every time they go to their phone, they, they, should, be seeing, they, they should be learning about mining. Why not? It's cool. It's awesome. We don't need to make it cool again. It's already cool. We just need to talk about it. Trust and empower your people to help tell your story. And this doesn't have to be a free for all. You don't have to be like, hey, all right, everybody, go nuts. Because that's terrifying. I get it. I guess, I, yeah, I'm a small business. I'm not a publicly traded company. I don't have a ton of liability here. But if there's ways to trust and empower your people to tell your story, to help share what they do today to day, I'm telling you, it is so valuable. It's so valuable. Even from a retention standpoint. Just the pride these people have in what they do. Let them talk about it. Let them share about it. It's huge. It's huge. And then if they're sharing about it, you know, the people around them are going to be seeing it. Man, this guy's stoked on running a D8. Maybe I should go run a D8. How do I do that? Oh, my company's hiring. Come on down. They'll even train you. <clears throat> and then create defined entry points in your organization. And if you have them, talk about them. It's not obvious. It needs to be obvious. I'm sorry. Everybody goes to college because it's obvious, because it's easy. Because I can go to the college website. They tell me exactly how to apply. They tell me what classes to take. They tell me how to go get a quarter million dollars of debt tomorrow without any question whatsoever. It's easy. I can go do all that. There's a process to follow. But I want to get into the mining industry. How, how the hell do I do that? Where, where, where do I go? And maybe it's simple and, and easy to you guys. Or maybe it's like, well, if, why, well, you need to be knocking on people's doors. Because that's what I did. And maybe, but also this, this, this next generation, we, hey, we've been brought up a whole lot differently. We've had the internet our whole lives. Everything's been right there. We need to be right there too. We need to go where these people are. So if you have defined entry point, if you don't have defined entry points in your organization, that's step one. What's a defined entry point we can create in our organization? Maybe it's a guy you know, sweeping the shop. I don't know what it is. And then two, let's talk about it and advertise it. Hey, we will invest in you if you come to work for us. <clears throat> so that's what I got. Nothing too groundbreaking. It's all simple stuff. But I really genuinely believe even just defining that higher purpose and talking about it consistently can make a dramatic difference. Can you tell us maybe a success story and maybe a not so successful story about a company that hired BuildWit to do their um, website design and HR and marketing and you know they bought in on the financial part of it um, and why it worked or maybe why it didn't work because of who you worked with or whatever? <clears throat> it's, uh, I mean, a, a, great, a great example is Rosso. We started working with them. Dylan Stevens called me early on and they were doing uh, they're probably three times the size revenue wise that they were three years ago when we started working with them. And now are we, you know, the reason for that? Absolutely not. But we're part of that. He said, hey, I want to I wanna get well known. I want people, when we walk into these meetings, they know who the hell we are. We did that. They walk into the meetings, people know who the hell they are now. They're still a small contractor in, in Nashville, Tennessee. They got about 150 people now. So they've grown three times since we started working with them. They've embraced it all. They've started sharing everything about it. So, so when people, when, when it's amazing, it's like, I don't know if you get like, like you've heard my podcast, you've heard me for, I don't know how many hours. It's a huge advantage. When I walk into the room and you've already been listening to me for a while, a long time now, that's a game changer. And that's what we're able to do with something like a social media. You know, you go in and, and if, uh, like uh, again, from a, not from a business development standpoint, from an employment standpoint, if I've been learning about your company and seen, about, seen your company for three months now and I come to apply for you, it's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different ball game. So I think that's worked well. Uh, frankly, the first year of business, I just got my ass handed to me. So, so it was just brutal because I was, this, I was like a, a little bull in a china shop, just, just running around everywhere, knocking shit over left and right telling all these people, you guys are doing it wrong, you need to do it this way, like I know best, uh, terrible approach, not at all. 
so now my new approach, and, and I, didn't, I don't work with most of the companies I worked with that first year for that reason. Um, so that, now that new approach is, hey, this, this current generation, like you guys have done a fantastic job. You're, you're, you're why we're here, that's fantastic. You guys have so much to teach. I'm, I'm, I, I wanna learn as much as I can from you guys. But also, the world's changing, so we need to figure out how to, to meet in the middle here. Like, hey, I'm, I'm over here, you guys are over there. Let's figure out where that middle point is. Let's work together here and not make enemies out of one another because that's not going to do anyone any good. Let's come together. So that's uh, kind of vague, but. No, good. Have, you had, uh, have you worked with any companies that had any kind of social media policies that you've had to you know, deal with and encounter whenever you go in to try to help them with their hiring? Yeah, I mean, like we work with this, uh, this big mining company, North American Coal, North American Mining. And with any big mining company, the social media policy is don't post on social media, like not allowed. And we're going onto these mines now and we're photographing these mining operations. Like I was up in North Dakota in January uh, for the first time ever, which is really, really cool. Um, and so again, it's meeting them where they are. And so it's, hey, why don't we come in and let's start telling these stories and let's, you guys approve everything so everything's safe and everything's looking good and let's start sharing a little bit online and let's start talking about the company. And it's just like, baby steps, kind of warming them up a little bit. Let's, let's do it in a way everybody, everybody will agree to, beginning. It might make you guys a little bit uncomfortable, but we're not saying we need to go full bore. Let's just go, okay, hey, if I can go there, let's just go here, let's try it out. And then now we've been working with them for a year and, and the you know, CEO of the company is, is DMing me on Instagram now saying, man, the guys just love it every time you guys come out and, and you guys have done a, such an amazing job telling our story and, and you go out to the, I went out to this mine, their Falkirk mine. It's, it's, a, it's been there for decades, I think since the 70s, maybe early 80s. And uh, the mine president and the vice president are there and they tour us through and they're like, how can we see these pictures? And the guys are so excited to have you guys out and it just changed the whole, changed everything because we're giving them the opportunity to share what they do with people. Like some of their like, wives, husbands, kids have never seen what the hell they do. And we're giving them the opportunity to just do that. What does that do for pride, retention? What does that do for culture? What does that do for the overall morale of your business? It dramatically changes it. So we've worked with now a lot of bigger companies like that. They're a publicly traded company. And we've just incrementally gone just a little bit further, a little bit further. And it's just, a, it's just gonna be a, a long, long process to get them just more and more comfortable with it. So we haven't, it, you know, it's not like everybody can go post on social media right now. It's still, everything needs to be reviewed and, and we need to be careful with how we present coal mining because there are a lot of people that don't like coal mining and there's MSHA and so on and so forth. But we've done it in a way that's, that's really created some meaningful impact there. Which, uh, which platform have you seen the most success um, like Instagram, Facebook, mostly Instagram, now TikTok, but I'd say Instagram has been awesome. LinkedIn is really fantastic. LinkedIn is super underrated. We kind of share on all of them, but if you just want to share on one, I'd probably start with Instagram. I'll be around, I think, most of the afternoon. So if you guys want to chat, I'm happy to, happy to chat. <laughs>